Peter Robinson has, has flown in <laughs> as part of a whirlwind trip, I guess, of the U.S. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so he's, he's got some really interesting work that he's done that shows the power of looking into the genome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so my problem is significantly easier than proteins um, finding changes in DNA. And um, I need some way of, do I just go like this or? So um, I, I thought I'd start off, I know this audience is mixed and not just scientists and geneticists. I, I thought I'd just start off and, and try to give you a sense of how next generation sequencing technologies are really changing the playing field, changing the, the paradigm of how we can diagnose uh, genetic disorders, rare diseases. And I, I think it's realistic to expect that um, we're going to discover the remaining three or 5,000 uh, Mendelian diseases in the next decade using these technologies. So this is an enormous acceleration. So where are we coming from? Um, in um, the late 70s, a couple of groups, including uh, Sanger, um, developed ways for sequencing DNA, which uh, basically led to the first um, wave of disease gene discoveries. And essentially, a lot of this turned into um, diagnostics that demands targeted knowledge. So you have to know what gene are you looking for. You have to design your PCR primers, which basically amplify the genetic sequences of this gene and, and allow you to, to look for changes in that sequence. And so this is the typical paradigm. If you have somebody where you know clinically what the disease very probably is, you can look into a database like OMIM, figure out what the gene is likely to be, and you can, you can go and sequence it. But this basically demands that you have knowledge about the gene. Um, if you don't know what the gene is, then there were a number of ways of doing this. But the, the primary one was linkage analysis, where you basically started off with a family with um, five or eight or ten people who were affected, and you looked for markers across the genome, so just variant sequences across the genome. And if you happen to find out, let's say, that all of the people who had the disease had a particular marker on, let's say, chromosome 3 in a certain position, you could say that the disease gene must be linked to that part of the disease. That usually led to, um, is there a, a pointer maybe somewhere? Ah, I see. This led to um, the... Um, yeah, this basically led to the discovery of a linkage interval. So using these statistical methods, you found a portion of the genome that usually contained, let's say, 100 to 300 genes. And most of the research projects uh, involved sequencing one gene after the other. And this, uh, you know, I've been involved in one or two myself. This, this took years, five years maybe, uh, on, a, on a typical project. And um, so very, in, in the last few years, um, a new sequencing technology called next generation sequencing has come about. And um, it's also become possible to uh, investigate the so-called exome. So the, the genes, or at least the coding regions of our genes, make up a very small percentage of our genome. Uh, depending on how you define it, let's say 1 or 1.5 percent. Um, and at least of the mutations that have been uh, discovered to date have almost all affected this 1.5 percent of our genome. And um, so essentially what the current efforts for using next generation sequencing technology to discover disease genes and diagnostics do is to first capture this portion of the genome. And essentially um, there are a couple of companies who make uh, basically um, oligonucleotides attached to beads that uh, hybridize to the exons and the interesting bits of our genome um, allow this to be pulled down out of solution. So after you've you know, uh, taken blood of a patient and isolated genomic DNA, you can mix it with these beads and then you can pull down the interesting bits of the genome and uh, concentrate on them. Um, and 
I'm, I'm not going to talk about the technology, but um, there are now uh, about five uh, companies and more every year who are making machines that um, allow you to sequence previously unimaginable quantities of, of DNA in, in a very short time. And um, they've all got subtle differences, but in a sense, um, this is a very expensive box that probably will cost about a half a million to uh, a million dollars or euros. And the box contains a bunch of pumps and a very good camera and a place to put a little slide like this. And um, it's on the, the one that we use, which is by Illumina, there are eight flow cells. And um, essentially, you take the DNA that you've captured from the exome, as I showed you in the previous slide, and just uh, inject it into this flow cell. And the fragments um, basically hybridize to, to adapters on, on the flow cell, such that you've got millions and millions and millions of individual molecules. Um, this is then processed in, in a number of steps, uh, cluster generation, and so, but essentially um, the, the important bit the important point is that you're starting off with anywhere between 10 to 100 single molecules that um, are not the result of, or not necessarily the result of targeted amplification by PCR, but can represent essentially all of the genes in, in, in our genome. Um, just to give you an idea of, of, of uh, what this costs and, and how much work this is um, to do a single run uh, is uh, in, in Europe at least about four to six thousand euros. The um, let's say dollars and the uh, costs for capturing the the exome are uh, about two hundred and fifty to five hundred per sample. Uh, compare this to the costs of sequencing one large gene, which is about the same. So this is an enormous savings in in money and time, even though it's still you know not trivial. Um, What's even more interesting, um, these machines basically uh, work on modifications of the chemistry that we've had, a, had around for the last couple of decades. There's a third generation using um, technologies such as nanopore that um, work with different principles that are going to be even cheaper and even faster. And um, you all probably have heard of Moore's Law with the computers that basically every 18 months computers have twice as much memory and the processors work twice as fast. This law is, is I think, takes about nine months with these machines over the last couple of years. So there's been an enormous progress and, and more is coming. Um, so, but that doesn't really solve our problems. Um, the, um, so I, I run a mixed wet lab and bioinformatics group and um, I'm not gonna go into the entire analysis pipeline. Uh, I'll just say that the problems of so what, what you get from this machine are reads, and these reads now encompass about 150 nucleotides, so they're st still shorter than what you get with, got with uh, Sanger sequencing, but you get 100 million of them per, per run, and um, the first thing you need to do is to put these together. You have to figure out where is this coming from. You didn't start with a targeted sequence, so you've got to map this back to the genome. Um, and you get basically what looks like a multiple alignment. So at any one position in the genome, you might have 100 or 200 reads. And um, there are various programs that look at these reads and look for variants. So I'm using this abbreviation called a single nucleotide variant, SNV. Um, this uh, basically means any single nucleotide uh, call which differs from your, your reference sequence. And that, um, that's basically the, the primary result of analysis. And um, this is still not entirely trivial, but this basically works. So once you get this set up, you don't have to think too hard about that part of your pipeline. But um, now if, if you've just sequenced an individual or a family, uh, you've got on the order of 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 variants for that one inter individual. So you've got, let's say, 30,000 changes in the exome of your patient, and you've got to figure out which change or which changes are correlated with the disease. That's what you're interested in. And that, that, is, um, 
that's that's what my my group is interested in using computational techniques to to um, to, to to find the actual disease causing gene. So um, I I thought before I tell you about our work, I would just give you a very brief background about what's happening today because I say this is really changing the playing field and. Mm -hmm. I think everybody who's involved in rare diseases um, is, is going to be using these methods in the next couple of years. So what, what do you do? How can you actually use this, given that if you, if you just have the primary result of 30,000 uh, variants, it doesn't help you too much? How do you actually go from that to a result? And I, I think today there are uh, four main methods of doing this. The first is pretty simple. So I, I, I'm calling it the intersection method. That basically means you take 10 patients who have the same disease, whose disease gene is unknown, and you sequence them, and I'll show you that actually in a second, so I'll, I'll just skip this for, for, for now. But basically, the, the thing is, you're, you're looking for one gene that has variance in, in all affected patients. Okay, so this works if you have a large collection of patients who you know or suspect have uh, a mutation in the same gene. Another very interesting thing which was uh, pioneered by the group of Han Brunner in, in Nijmegen in Holland is to, to look for de novo mutations, uh, basically meaning you sequence the parents as well as a child with spontaneous disease uh, under the assumption that the child might have a, a de novo uh, a mutation in what would be an autosomal dominant disorder. And that has turned out to be a very powerful method. The last two are family-based. So if you just have one or two fa smallish families, um, you can either uh, perform linkage analysis on this family, as I showed you, and then concentrate your exome sequencing on that on that interval. And the fourth one is something that my group has been working on. This has basically been using the exome data directly to perform implicit linkage analysis without actually uh, having having to do it. So I'm I'm going to start off with a, an introduction to the intersection method. This has been the one that's been most in, in the most seen in the articles. So, yeah, this is the problem. Actually, I already said it that um, if you if you just sequence uh, any one of us, um, you're going to find approximately 30,000 variants to the reference uh, sequence in the exome, about a thousand on the X chromosome, about two or three million in the genome. Um, and the first thing you can do is basically go to databases of common variants, such as dbSNP, and filter them out. And even doing this, you're left with a, a very high number, thousands of, um, of variants that are, are just not classified. And uh, also small in insertions and deletions are not quite as common, but they're, they're still enough that um, it's, it's an interpretation problem. And so this, the, the group of uh, Jay Shendor um, were the pioneers in this area. So they, they published an, a number of uh, uh, excellent papers on this topic. I'm going to show that I think this is their first paper about, uh, uh, and, and uh, amongst the, the people they, they analyzed were four pa people with Freeman Sheldon syndrome. So this, there was a, this had a known disease gene, but they, they basically pretended they didn't know it and tried to find it using this data. And um, so they uh, sequenced these individuals. They got an average of 51-fold coverage of the exome. So on average, each position in the, an, on each exon had a multiple alignment with 50 reads. And um, doing so, they, the, the, one of the problems with this method is that the coverage is variable. And uh, so an important statistic is what percentage of the genome has an adequate coverage, which uh, an eight-fold is actually not not enough, I would say something more like 20-fold is needed to be sure. But um, this, these are their results. I'm not going to go through all of this, but what was really uh, important was that there was a surprisingly high number of mutations to be found even in, in people who did not have a rare disease. So when I, when I went to medical school, um, and it wasn't that long ago, they, they told us when we were studying genetics that so they looked into the audience and they said, each one of you has one mutation in a recessive gene. And actually, it's much, much more than that. Uh, and um, these, these are the numbers that uh, Jay Shendor's group came up with um, that on, a on average, each person had, for instance, about 10 or 20 uh, nonsense, rare nonsense mutations per genome. This is similar to the data that we've been producing in, in Berlin. 
there's been another paper that found, um, used a different technology and they found a number which was 10 times higher. So this, this means, um, and this is important, that even if you find a variant that looks like a mutation, it might have nothing to do with the disease that you're studying in that particular individual. So it's not enough to find things that look pathogenic. And so the key, the key challenge for actually using this method to discover new disease genes, and also hopefully in the near future to use this method for diagnostics in a more routine setting, is basically to decide which of the many, many variants are causal for the disease, okay? And um, this is extremely difficult to do right now on a single person, uh, even if we only consider the, the things that look like they're pathogenic, so non-synonymous missense mutations, splice site mutations, and indels, okay? That, that's not sufficient. And so intersection filtering, I mean, this is a, you know, a pretty simple idea, but powerful, and th this was, again, developed by the, the Shendor group, and, and Sarah Ng had a, a number of, of great uh, papers using this. Um, ba basically, they, they had four affected individuals. Uh, I just wrote A, B, C, D, and um, they, in individual A, they found 4,500 candidates. They looked into a database of common variants and uh, were able to find 4,000 of them, so 500 were left, okay? Um, they looked into um, some in-house sequencing and they could get rid of another 100, but they still had 360 candidates in one person, okay? And that means, I think, 360 genes had candidate mutations. So this one result was useless. They had basically no idea which of these 360 genes is related to the disease. And, but then they said, well, if all four people have a mutation in the same gene, it's likely to be the, the disease gene. So basically, they just continued this intersection and doing the same thing, taking two individuals, there were only 10 candidates left. Taking three individuals or four, there was only one candidate left, which turned out to be the, the known disease gene. So they, they basically showed that using this intersection approach, you can find um, disease gene mutations. Um, there's a number, number of ways of filtering data in bioinformatics. One of the most common is to predict pathogenicity. So, you know, if you just see a variant in a protein sequence, you have no idea if this is actually pathogenic, if this is affecting biochemical function, unless you do some analysis. This could be a neutral variant, of course. And so one of the uh, programs is called Profile or Polyfen. This is an output of Profiler. And, um, you can also use this to reduce these, these numbers. And that's what the, the same did, group did in, a, in another paper on uh, Kabuki syndrome. And um, again, th this showed sort of a weakness of the approach that using this loss of function filter, using programs similar to the one, one I showed you, uh, when they did this intersection approach, there was nothing left in the intersection. So um, this was a false negative result. Um, they, they basically, um, went back to the data, used a number of heuristics. Uh, it's a great paper, I would highly recommend it if, if you're interested in exome sequencing. Uh, and, but they, and they wound up finding, finding the mutation. But I, I think for today, um, I, I think it's important to know an intersection filtering um, can be helpful if you've got a lot of patients. Um, there is a pretty high danger of false negative and false positive um, conclusions. Uh, I know of some groups in, in Europe who have missed a uh, disease gene using this approach that was found otherwise. Um, and again, it seems that the intuition, interpretation of the results requires intuition and probably also luck. So at, the, at this point, um, informatics is, is not able to reliably identify the candidate gene. So another approach, um, uh, is, is linkage. So basically what these groups did, and this was very successful, as you see, these are seven different groups, I think, by, uh, in the last few months, there have been another five or six articles similar to this. They did traditional linkage analysis, which identified a region of typically 100, 200, 300 genes. They then did their exome sequencing and just looked at these 300 genes, as opposed to the 20 some thousand uh, genes in the genome. And this focus um, helped them to actually find the disease gene. So 
now, now I'm going to switch to the, the work that we've been doing. Uh, uh, and this, this combination of, of linkage working seemed to us to be quite interesting. And um, we, we wanted to develop a method to actually do linkage directly in the data. So without going into details, one problem of linkage is that in order to get a significant result, a LOD score, you need to have a reasonably, reasonably big family. And that's another problem for rare disease research because now a lot of the very rare diseases, uh, are, there's just one or two families in the world or available to your, to your lab. And if they're not very big, then it's just theoretically impossible to get a significant LOD score. So the method doesn't always work. And um, so we, we basically um, developed a method that does implicit linkage analysis in the sequences of um, affected children uh, in uh, um, a families segregating autosomal recessive diseases. And um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about this disease, Mabry syndrome, and I'll tell you a little bit about our method. On a, uh, I'm not going to go into mathematical details. And um, so my colleague, Denise Horn, described a new subtype of Mabry syndrome, which is hyperphosphatasia. This word basically means a persistently elevated level of the enzyme alkaline phosphatase in the blood, mental retardation syndrome. And what Denise de uh, delineated was a subtype with um, various um, dysmorphic features, so deviations from, uh, from normality such that, for instance, the the eyes are a bit farther apart than one might normally see. And um, we uh, basically analyzed the family that you see here. And this was done by my colleague, Michael Schweiger, in uh, another part of Berlin. And um, when we sequenced them, the primary analysis that I discussed a few minutes ago left uh, 14 candidate genes. So we did basically an intersection on the three siblings, and we were still left with 14 candidate genes and said, hmm. Which one, which one is it? And um, then, then we came up with this idea. And uh, this is basically based on something called identity by descent. So in autosomal recessive diseases, the parents are healthy carriers of heterozygous mutations. And um, so if we have multiple affected children, all of whom are doubly heterozygous or homozygous for the same mutation, then the children must have inherited the same haplotype, the same chromosomal region from uh, the father and from the mother. So in this case, if we imagine that the disease gene is located in this region of some chromosome, we see that both siblings, or all siblings in fact, inherit the red chromosome from the father and the orange chromosome, orange chromosome from the mother. Okay, and um, this, um, Many of you have heard about homozygosity mapping in which this area would be homozygous because the, if the parents are related, if they're consanguineous, then both parents will be uh, inheriting the same chromosome to the children. So the, both ch the all affected children would have this basically an, an identical chromosome in the area of the disease gene. What I'm talking about here is more general. These, these are potentially compound heterozygous, so they've at, at, uh, inherited the same chromosome from the father in all cases and the same from the mother in all cases, but they can be distinct. This is known as um, IBD2. Um, okay, I mentioned this briefly. So in, um, um, I think I already mentioned this about homozygosity mapping. Uh, I'll just skip this slide. So the problem is um, we can't observe identity by descent directly. Um, all we see is the actual sequence. So this is known as identity by state. Um, we're using this word in a slightly different sense. So we're calling this IBS star to basically mean a region where all of the siblings are observed to have the same sequence, be it the same homozygous sequence or the same heterozygous sequence. And it turns out this is key to actually seeing the identity by, by descent. And um, the difficulty is multiple. So if we have a non-IBD2 region, so a chance reason in the region in the genome, it's possible that any one variant might be the same in all siblings. Just because of a variant is common 
and is out there in the population. And you know, with computer simulations, you can say that the chance for this is 31% of at random. Also, even if we do have a region that's IBD2, we can observe it not to be IBS star. So this little thing is supposed to be not because of sequencing errors. And in fact, the, the next generation technologies are still highly error prone, approximately 5% for each, for each variant. And um, so this is something for bioinformaticians. I'll, I'll just very briefly give you an int intuition on how this works. Um, these are the sequences of mother and father. And here are the DNA nucleotide sequences. And we see in this region, which is IBD2, so this could be related to the disease gene, each of the siblings, one, two, three, has, has inherited a same copy. But in this case, there's a sequencing error. So it looks like it's not identical by state. So that's the zero. On the other hand, here, um, in this region, they're not identical by descent, so not IBD2. But by chance, they all have inherited the same combination. So this kind of noise we have to distinguish between if, we're, if we want to find the IBD2 regions. Um, this is basically done by something called a hidden Markov model, which, um, which basically uh, models the transition between different kinds of states in the genome. So a transition between an IBD2 state to another IBD2 state is easy. That means there's no recombination. So recall that um, here, there, when we he see a break like this, there must have been recombination in the uh, parental meiosis. And uh, this is why most of the genome is sort of mixed up. And, and this is why we can actually see this signal. But recombination doesn't occur that, that often. It's, it's a little bit less um, common, which is why to explain this one mistake here, it's much easier just to say this was a sequencing error, which is emitted here. And the other, another possible explanation would be to say, that there's an, a recombination here and another recombination here, so that we're sort of leaving and re-entering an IBD2 state as an explanation for this. Because these two guys are so improbable, this situation gets weighted a lot less than this situation. Anyway, so you can use some statistical uh, tests uh, and create a LOD score or the chance of being an IBD2 versus the chance of not being an IBD2. And you can plot this along the chromosomes. In fact, we, we did this and found that there was a good candidate here called, um, I think that's coming here, uh, PIGV. And um, actually, um, this, this, once we saw this, um, we immediately recognized this must be the disease gene. PIGV is an enzyme in the GPI anchor biosynthesis pathway, which um, was of high interest because alkaline phosphatase is, is actually anchored by, has a GPI anchor which keeps it on the cell surface. So you can imagine if this is not working, the alkphos can be released from the cell surface and that's the cause of the increased concentration of alkaline phosphatase, the hyperphosphatasia that is observed in this, in this syndrome. And anyway, we went on to look at a couple of other families and found more mutations in highly uh, conserved uh, regions of this gene. So here we see human going down to zebrafish. And the mutations that we found affected residues that were conserved uh, throughout this evolutionary time. So um, what does this do? The GPI pathway consists of about 20 enzymes, which um, create, as you see here, a, an anchor which can be attached to the end of a protein, over 100 proteins um, are, are modified in this way. And this has the effect basically of, of, of anchoring this protein to the cell surface. The disease gene, PIGV, is, is basically one of these 20 enzymes in, the, in this pathway. So um, even though we were pretty sure that we had found the right gene, we wanted to uh, um, do some biochemical tests to confirm this. This was done in collaboration with uh, the groups of uh, Uwe Kölsch and Christian Meisel and also at our hospital in, in Berlin. Uh, this is a flow cytometry. And essentially what you do is you measure the amount of proteins on the cell surface. So if the hypothesis that I told you was correct, that 
PIGV leads to a defect in the GPI anchor, then a prediction would be that less GPI anchored proteins are present on the cell surface. And that's something you can measure with flow cytometry. This antibody called FLARE actually directly measures the GPI anchor. And we see here that um, essentially the farther off to the right you are, the less amount you have. So we see that the, this patient, had, uh, all of the patients actually had a, a lower level of GPI anchor. One of the anchored proteins is called CD16, and we basically saw a very similar protein for that. So um, this, this seemed to show that the patients with um, Mabry syndrome actually do have a defect in GPI anchor, which, which made sense. And the, the other thing that, that's nice to do if you find a, a gene is, is to show actually that the mutation that you found in it does cause a biochemical defect. And uh, this, this actually goes along with the previous uh, talk that um, the, we think that the, well, at least this mutation destabilizes the protein and causes, causes it to be uh, degraded uh, more quickly. And uh, in this case, this is the wild. So I'm not going to go into all of the details, but basically we cloned this. This group was Taro Kinoshita in Osaka, did 95% um, of this. They cloned the gene, and this is the wild type. They transfected it into cells, which had been made uh, PIGV uh, uh, um, deficient. And so this is just the transfected version of this. We see uh, this signal. And this was a signal um, from the, this mutate, uh, mutation, which we had found in our patients. They also showed that the mutants were not able to rescue uh, CD59 or CD55 cell for surface activity. So we had a couple of um, lines of evidence uh, that we think uh, showed that PIGV was, is in fact the disease gene in, in Mabry syndrome. I'm going to close very briefly. Um, so I, I, the method that we developed basically replaces the need for doing linkage analysis. So this saves money and time. And um, mathematically, it's, it's a pretty trivial adaptation of our algorithm to also get um, X chromosomal diseases. In this case, um, generally, there's a heterozygous uh, mother and males have one copy of the X chromosome. So actually, the, the informatics problem is, is a lot easier to solve using a very similar method um, with um, a, some modifications. We, we sorry, were able to show um, basically that th this also works. And um, we were able to identify, um, this was a test case in, in a known gene, this, this mutation. Um, essentially, that, that means that it's now cheaper to go directly to targeted sequencing of the X chromosome and just completely uh, skip uh, linkage analysis and, and use an IBD method. And the, the price, the, the ec ec um, economy is changing so quickly, I, I suspect that it will soon be just as cheap to, to do that with autosomal recessive disorders. OK, so um, to sum up, I hope that I've convinced you that exome sequencing is a paradigm change. So we can now quickly identify disease genes. Um, there are various problems. I've shown you some of the successful cases. Uh, I think every lab that you talk to, including our own, will tell you there are cases where you do not find the mutation. The mutation might be located in the place that is not being captured by your beads, or there may be other reasons. That, that's still an area of active research. Um, the, there's three main ways of doing this. One is intersection, if you've got, if you've got a lot of families. Linkage analysis, uh, as I've, I've shown you here, and also the search for de, no, uh, de novo mutations. So thank you for listening. These are the people who did the work. Uh, in case they're listening on the internet, thank you very much. Peter, <laughs> Peter Kovitz, uh, uh, Christian Rödelsperger, Sebastian Bauer really drove this, this research, the development of the algorithms. Uh, these are also very important people at, at our institute. Um, Michael Schweiger has uh, set up an excellent uh, sequencing pipeline at the Max Planck Institute, and Andreas Chach is uh, responsible for a lot of the clinical research there. Okay, thanks very much. Wonderful talk. Um, with, in Marbury syndrome, with uh, alkaline phosphatase falling off of the leukocytes, does it also fall off of osteoblasts? 
and therefore give you a hypophosphatase-like phenotype? So, <clears throat> yeah, that, that's an excellent question. So the, the background to the question is that there are basically four different kinds of alkaline phosphatase. Um, we, we haven't actually investigated which isoform is, mo is most um, affected, but that, that is an interesting area for research. I think uh, the leukotriene alkaline phosphatase is, is the same as the bone, or you might uh, draw a, a hypophosphatase like yeah, uh, yeah. phenotype. Second quick question, if you're dealing with a unique uh, autosomal dominant, highly penetrant disease, affected members in maybe three generations, a total of 12, should exome sequencing get you right there? So essentially it depends how you do this. Um, and you, you need some way of reducing the search space to get to the mutation. If you have that many affected people in a family, you can certainly do linkage analysis and uh, get a good LOD score. And that would allow you to just concentrate on that particular portion of the, uh, of the exome. Um, we think you can do this similarly just by exome sequencing. And that's, that's an active area of research in my lab right now. Yeah. Is it uh, more likely that you'll get to the mutation by just doing the exome sequencing and not the mapping if you have such a big case? I mean, I think you can combine it. I mean, just like we did, I showed you for X-linked, I think you can combine it for dominant, too. That's, I mean, it's basically a question of economics. So right now, uh, there are companies that will do an exome for 1,000 euro. And I, so it's it, it just basically how, how much that costs at, at, your, at your institute to do this sort of thing. Uh, if you'd like, when you ask a question, there are microphones in front of practically everybody. All you got to do is bend those things up, and, and please use them if you have questions. Somebody just told me this. Uh, any more questions? Emil? <laughs> yes, I wanted to ask about... Um... I think you got it. <laughs> Don't even... Yeah, so we, we've done an extensive computer simulation and um, with three affected individuals, just sequencing them, there is a, a false negative rate of something like 1%, false positive of about 5%, which seems to be acceptable. The same method doesn't work quite as well if you just have two affected individuals, and then it would be, in fact, useful to sequence unaffected. The, the amount of power you get from that is less because an unaffected can have one mutation and not two. So there, there's a little bit less reduction of the search space, but cer certainly that, that's possible, yeah. 